It's been a few weeks since the news broke. Teenage Afghan national team soccer player Zaki Anwari fell to his death. Zaki was one of several people who were clinging to a U.S. military plane that flew out of Kabul during the Afghanistan evacuation a few weeks ago. Hello, this is Rev Brad. I have to be honest, today is a hard day and a hard podcast. I've actually gone back and forth a bit on whether to make a pod for this week as some heavy things from recent times and from past times make it hard. But today on From the Touchline, I want to take a moment to honor Zaki and to speak about something that I imagine drove Zaki to take hold of that plane, even at the risk of his own life. I want to talk about hope. We're back after this. He's found the space, and he's found the back of the net. Just a little off foot, thinking he's going to go far post. Not strong enough with his right hand. Whips that one in. Far post, almost made him in, and they have. He has the hat trick. The second in his career. The third of the night. The hat trick hero. Talked about you're not going to be able to sustain that kind of pressure. the corner goes towards the near post and you're the angle and what a goal what a goal the video images of two people falling from that u.s air force c-17 after takeoff are troubling to watch and those images uh, bring back memories of others falling Uh, people who jumped from the towers in new york some 20 years ago jumping 100 stories to their death to escape the heat and flames of the buildings that burned and we commemorate that uh, this weekend One of the people who fell from the planes was identified as Zaki Anwari. Zaki, if you didn't know or haven't read, is described by friends and teammates as a talented center back and a good student. He's said to have had some dreams of being a professional footballer and one day representing Afghanistan on the world's biggest stage, perhaps at the World Cup, maybe in professional soccer, somewhere at a high elite level. But as the Taliban marched on Kabul and took over the city, Zaki and some of his friends made their way to the airport, desperate to leave, desperate to find a way out. Such sadness. Condolences from Afghan leaders, from from FIFA, from others in the football community were widely shared. And I have to admit, as an American, I've largely been shielded from the pain and terror of what many around the world experience in a much more regular, maybe even a daily fashion. And certainly this week, the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and the terrorist attacks bring back certain memories, but by the grace of God, myself, my family, most of whom are close to me, have been spared from so much. I wonder, though, if some might think it strange that Zaki held on to that plane. What would drive him to do something that uh, most of us might consider just maddening? There's really no way he could have survived. Well, I have to believe that Zaki was driven by either one of two things, fear or hope. Certainly fear of the Taliban, of what might happen under such a regime. Maybe that drove him to the airport, maybe even uh, encouraged him to try and gain access to a flight and and leave the country in the sort of hurried fashion that we, we get a sense from the story and from what we read. I read a Washington Post article which noted that the Afghan men's national team hasn't didn't compete internationally from a a long period between 1984 to 2002. And they cited some different things, the Soviet occupation, the civil war in the country, and the rule of the Taliban. And essentially, recreational activities and sport were largely banned during that time. It was really unsafe to play. It wasn't until the Taliban regime was taken down in 2001 that soccer could begin to compete again. And Afghanistan uh, most recently had qualified, f- tried to qualify for the World Cup in 2006, and it was just a few years ago uh, in 2013 that Afghanistan actually won the South Asian Football Federation Championship. So they were getting close, and they were becoming better. And so maybe Zaki, knowing this history, believing his sport, his passion, his love of the game was likely to be shut down, maybe he left out of fear. Or maybe there were more personal reasons that we don't know about. Maybe his family and others were somehow connected to insurgency or or the U.S. Or there were more intimate reasons to fear the Taliban takeover. We just don't know. But I believe there was something perhaps even stronger than fear that might have caused Zaki Anwari to continue to hold on to that plane as it taxied and eventually took off. And I think it was that second thing. I think there was something within him for the sake of hope that maybe, just maybe, he might survive, he might make it, and this might be his only chance. I may date myself here, but there's a powerful moment that occurs in the film, The Shawshank Redemption. I wonder if you've seen it. 
In the scene I'm referring to, and I'll leave a link to the YouTube cut of it in the liner notes, Andy Dufresne, played by Tim Robbins, returns from spending two weeks in the hole, essentially a room with no light in the prison. His offense? He played music over the prison's loudspeaker system. In the conversation that ensues with his fellow inmates, he describes how music is powerful, reminding a person of realities that exist beyond prison walls. He ultimately goes on to describe it as hope. To this, his friend, Red, played by Morgan Freeman, retorts, Hope is a dangerous thing. Hope can drive a man insane. It's got no use on the inside. You better get used to that. And he pauses for a moment and replies back to him, like Brooks did. Brooks was an older criminal, had been released, and he essentially killed himself because he couldn't cope with the changes that had gone on in the world, and he, he longed to go back to the familiarity of the prison where he was, quote-unquote, someone, where he felt like he had identity and family and relationships and other things. Well, I, I share that example because I believe hope is a dangerous thing. Hope can drive us to do maddening things, but it is not useless. Hope is not something to be feared or avoided. Hope is important. But hope must necessarily have a companion. And let me explain what I mean. Listen to these words of Paul as he writes to Christians in the city of Rome from Romans 8. And and Paul here is writing about some of the suffering that Christian people are facing. And And I think probably not too far off from what people in Afghanistan have or will suffer under the Taliban regime. Verse 18, Paul begins, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to the frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Paul goes on, We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. That was Romans 8, 18 through 28. And I just want to highlight three things from this text. The first is that present sufferings for the children of God, uh, they don't compare to the glory that will ultimately be revealed in us. What what does this mean? I, I don't think we can fully know or appreciate what this might mean. But I think Paul's exhorting Christian believers here that there's something yet to be revealed in the lives of God's people. It's it's not seen, it's not yet known, but it is something that's destined to be glorious. You know, maybe we might consider the creation of a stained glass window. If you and I were to visit a stained glass worker's shop, we might see fragments of colored glass everywhere, disordered, unarranged. And we might think there's nothing very glorious about this. We might even think it's trash or garbage if we don't know where we're at or what's going on. And yet the artist, the glass worker, as they fashion the pieces, put them together, and eventually, when the light shines through the finished work, there's a glorious image or story to behold. I think that this might be along the lines of what we see and, and feel and experience right now. We, we can't see the finished work. We can only see misshapen shards of glass laying everywhere. And we can't discern anything glorious out of the whole mess. And yet the potential for a beautiful art piece or a beautiful picture or story is just waiting to be assembled. And I I think this is something close to what Paul has in mind for us. The suffering and the glory, it's not insulated. We still groan. The whole world groans. Even God himself groans, we learn. There is a groaning that goes beyond words, a groaning that expresses the deepest and darkest parts of ourselves, our hearts, our desires, our dissatisfaction, our disappointments and despairs. 
The suffering is real. The groaning is real. But Paul encourages us, this doesn't compare to the glory that is to come. The second highlight from this passage, I think, teaches us a number of things about hope. First, hope is part of the process of salvation. Our spiritual salvation comes about by the grace of God, but it's a grace that weaves together with the faith and hope of humanity. Somehow it's inextricably linked. Hope alone cannot save us. Faith alone cannot save us. Rather, it's a strange mix of the three, grace, faith, hope. Secondly, we learn that hope is about unseen things. There's an anticipatory state that we find in the midst of hope. Things are unseen. Things are not yet attained or attainable. Hope is about the things that we don't have yet. And finally, we learn that hope requires patience. Hope, the hope of salvation, the hope of rescue from the sufferings, the things that we face here in this life, it must necessarily have a patient waiting attached to it. You know, if I had just a few moments with Zaki in the airport, I would have encouraged him, hey, let's wait. Let's see, maybe there's another way out. Maybe there can still be hope. Maybe you don't have to hold on to the plane this way. Maybe it won't be as bad as we think. Maybe maybe things will be different this time. But I feel like there was something inside of him that, inside of Zaki, that couldn't wait. And maybe it was the fear. Maybe it was a misguided hope. There's, there's no way he would have survived a flight in that way. E- even if he could have hung on to the plane for the whole, the whole duration, there's no way. And, and here is where I think it's important to realize the third and final part of hope that comes out of this passage. It's important for us to realize. So let me read the first part of verse 26 again. It reads, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. You see, God knows that we're all pretty bad at waiting. We're all desperate. And we all have this impatient hope inside of us that we carry around with us. And we need help. We need God's help. And so the Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, enables us to wait, enables us to hope, groans along with us while we're waiting, groans for us while we're waiting. You know, if you've ever sat in a hospital waiting room while a loved one undergoes surgery, it's a difficult place. I find it's better sometimes to have someone wait with you, someone who's sensitive, loving, caring, not overbearing. Uh, They can help pass the time, maybe offer comfort, pray together, sit with you, Maybe just sit with you in silence, sit with you in solidarity. In the same way, God sits with us in our waiting. God is with us in the midst of our hope, with us in the midst of that that insanity that that hope sometimes drives within us. That that insanity that comes from a dangerous side of hope, a, a hope that's impatient or unchecked, unbalanced. And so there is God reaching out to us, calling us, calling us out, calling us back from that edge. Friend, perhaps you and I have never faced the fearful terror of the Taliban or being trapped and suffocated a hundred floors off the ground in a burning building. And I pray that you and I never have to go through something like that. But we all have within us this groaning, this hope, because we know something. This world is not right. This world is not safe. This world is not all that there is. And so there resides within us this internal hope, this eternal hope. It's a dangerous hope. But if we will but patiently wait, and if we will realize that God waits with us and for us, we are able to truly hope. There's another song. uh, I'll, I'll put a link in the notes that says, We can cry with hope. We can say goodbye with hope. We can grieve with hope. We can believe with hope. And we can wait with hope. We ache with hope. We hold on with hope. And we let go with hope. My friends, I pray that this hope, this God-given, God-aided hope resides in you. For all that we've gone through and all that is yet to come, and I pray that there is Somehow comfort for the family of Zaki Anwari and the many, many people like Zaki who are desperate and afraid. May somehow they and may we place our hope in God. Let me close this today with a prayer filled with hope. God, there is a deep groaning within our souls. We see the trouble of our world. We see the fear and terror around. We see the uncertainty that abounds. And yet we hope. 
Hope is a dangerous thing. Hope is a maddening thing. Please give us patience to wait with expectation. Please be present with us to wait for that ultimate glory, that ultimate reality. Hear our inward cries, those words that are not words, but reside deep inside. It is for something we cannot see. It is for something we do not yet have, and yet we know it's there somehow. We know we need it some way, and only you can supply. So come and redeem us, save us. Let us hold unswervingly to this great hope because we know you are faithful. Let us be anchored by this hope, this hope of heaven. And let us encourage each other as we wait, as we patiently wait, for our hope to be finally fulfilled, for our future to be forever secured. Amen. Dear friend, this is Rev. Brad, patiently waiting and hoping with you from the Touchline. Touchline.